So I want to kind of have a sort of high-level conversation of what's classically called a winner-take-all network, often just gone with the representation WTA network. And what this is at some level is saying, oh, look, I'm going to have I'm going to have some sort of structure that naturally chooses the largest of all of the inputs, or equivalently, the smallest is, again, an equivalently reasonable approach. And the question becomes, well, how do I begin to look for such structure? Where does this happen? And in fact, it's actually not hard to find um, in basic circuits. In fact, the simplest of all structures you think about is sort of taking what typically would take two inputs, V1 and V2, and its currents I1 and I2 going into a constrained current source with a constrained middle node, V. That's a differential pair, and probably many people may be familiar with that. If not, it has, has this wonderful property of the two currents here. We'll split whatever the bias current is at the lower end, and there is some sort of significant gain of that, of that function related to um, the tanch type function, the exponential functions of these transistors. What happens for a winner-take-all network is imagine instead of it's two, imagine it's three or four or some significant integer, let's call it m, of which I can continue all the way through, or some significant integer n of which I can look at all the way through. This becomes important because when ha what typically we see for a typical differential pair is between V1 and V2 that the largest of those, which is by a little bit bigger, is the one that gets most of the current. Well, the generalization goes like this, that the if I have multiple inputs for a differential pair, that the one that is a little bit larger of all the rest gets most of the current. Again, sort of leading to the concept of calling a winner-take-all. Now, there's many ways to look at what we mean by a winner-take-all circuit. There are ways to look at it in terms of sort of these classical transistor circuits. There are ways to look at this in terms of what that means um, in certain circuit, certain sort of circuits and topologies in, in neuroscience. Uh, it is a very, very important and general concept. But at its heart, you see it in this sort of simple differential pair where what you find is that this middle node V will be set effectively by the largest of all the inputs. So it's going to be related to kappa time and then effectively by the largest of all the inputs, either 1 through M or 1 through N, and obviously the bias will have an impact in the structure. And what will happen is that, you know, for the if this turns out to be the largest, whatever one is the largest is going to get most of the current or the reference current that's coming through that device. And everyone else is going to get a significantly smaller current. Well, this sort of comes from sort of the classic, you know, this sort of circuit then can get extended. The classical structure by John Lazaro in 1989 is sort of a winner-take-all circuit that many people sort of know and love and will work with in many cases, which is effectively this differential pair, but now it allows me to have current inputs, I1, I2 to IM, and then I have output currents I out one through I out M. And this structure turns out to be a very nice sort of high gain structure, um, and therefore allows me to do comparisons directly in the current. Now I can do a lower gain structure by saying let me have current mirrors with a current uh, current source constraint, so you can do a lot of lower gain kinds of kinds of approaches. But at the same time, having the gain is useful because sometimes you say, well, I'd like to be able to have a whole bunch of inputs and I'd like to know which is the largest of them, but that might only be by a small amount. And that turns out to be very helpful. Um, some might go, well, okay, taking a max of a structure, does that mean that I could eventually use this multiple times and say sort a whole bunch of an a whole sequence of analog numbers and the answer is yeah you could imagine doing that. Um, there's a lot of very interesting functions that you could start thinking about that you don't traditionally think about as classical analog circuit design. And yet at the same time we can talk about some classical analog design because just sort of take this sort of classical circuit by John Lazaro um, and go with two inputs. <laughs> 
Well, in that particular case, now I have something that looks like a differential pair, M1, M2, output 1 and 2, going through a current source with a middle node V and a current in there. But now I also have two transistors, M3 and M4, that act as the transistors that take the input current and make an output and make a differential output current. And what's interesting about the circuit, if you look at and do the analysis in a subthreshold case, what you find is that the difference of the output over the average sum, and again, that would basically be the bias current that's going through this structure, is going to be related to the difference of the inputs over its average. Again, it could be at many different levels. And this is important to notice that this type of a circuit actually works um, even if the sort of average current level for these two inputs is quite different from these two, from the output currents, from what's being normalized for the bias current. And that structure is going to be basically kappa over sigma, so a kappa being the gate coupling into surface potential, assuming all the transistors are equal, over sigma, which is basically the drain coupling into the surface potential at the source. And this number is pretty high. This number is right around, a, you know, it's a, typically it's in the hundreds to a thousand. Depends on the IC process you're looking at, but this is a pretty sizable number. And in fact, definitely gives you the sense that there's gain in this circuit and there's significant gain that we can work with in different places. And that gives us this sort of ability to not just say, I can get rid of some elements. And one of the main things we notice is that this whole structure is a way to generalize common mode feedback. It's a way to say, if there's something common between everybody, let me subtract it and then let me compare what's left over. Let me work with what's left over. And that turns out to be very, very important in understanding the circuit, but also then how you build classifiers around it. And having gain really opens up a lot of possibilities around these structures.